We're going to start a series of messages, and the title is called His Great Name. That's the title of the messages that we're starting. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the names of God. So earlier in the summer, we talked about uh, who Christ says that we are. So what are the words that Christ uses to, say, uh, to talk about who we are? But this uh, time, the next few weeks at least, we're going to look at who is God? What is his great name all about? In, in the English language, we, we use the word God and Father and a few different things to describe God. But what is his great name and what are the, the words, the language that is used to describe how great he is? And uh, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at. So it's part one of at least three messages, and uh, we'll leave it at that for now. But today's part one is about God of the Fathers. So these are the names that uh, God uses, and really it's a God of the Fathers really just describes um, the, uh, the, the fa- uh, fa- uh, fathers of faith, so to speak. So we're looking at Old Testament people who God spoke with and who God uh, revealed these names to in Scripture. So there's a lot of Old Testament Scripture today, but I think it's something for us really to focus on. So I've been mulling, uh, working over this, these messages in my mind uh, f- uh, over the summer, and I've really been thinking about this thought of who God is. So it's not a trick question. Uh, I've just been throwing it uh, through my mind. It's not something I want us to get hung up on or something for us to uh, get all concerned about. But who is, uh, who God is. And, and, but I want to focus on the title. I actually got this title this week. His great name. His name is great. That's what it is. His name is great. So we're going to talk about a few things. Okay, so here we go. So today we're uh, beginning this series of messages, and we're going to cover the names of God that we find in Scripture. And the interesting thing about it is I believe uh, something today about God that I find some believers uh, these days don't believe in. So I believe something today that I, I find some others don't believe in about God. You see, I believe these things. Uh, one, some of these things. Or I believe all these things, but there's other things as well is what I'm trying to say. Every, I believe some of the words I'm saying. Yes, okay. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right. I stayed up too late last night. Okay. Apparently, I was thinking about this message, and it's not helping me. All right. Every single word God says is true. That's what I believe. Now, some people today have a hard time with that, and they get all worked up about it, and they start freaking out. I believe it's it's true. And sometimes we uh, get upset about the words that God says because they convict us. <laughs> I find, as I found, especially as a youth pastor, that uh, we, we, we uh, mix up God doesn't like me with actually God is just convicting me of something. Sometimes we say God's not doing something for me. God's not there for me, et cetera, et cetera. But actually he's just convicting us sometimes of the things that we're going through in our life. Uh, he, God has our best interests in mind. I believe that with all of my heart. God has our best interests in mind. It's true. He has a plan for us no matter who we are. No matter who we are, no matter uh, what our situation, uh, where we've been, he has a plan for us. No matter how frustrating and devastating your situation may feel today, he has a plan for you. So how does God's name help our circumstances today? All right, so that's what I want to get into is these names that God reveals in the Old Testament, how do they help us today? So how does he help me uh, get out of debt? How does God help me get out of debt? How does uh, God uh, find the right companion for my life? Uh, How do I uh, get out of my current bad situation? How does God help me get out of that? And so on and so on. All these questions we ask God about and ask our uh, uh, friends in faith about. Obviously a list goes on like that. What I've come across in some of my research so far is that God has this amazing plan for his people. That's what God's plan is. It's amazing. In his name, we can take a new step each day with confidence. In his name, we can do it with confidence because we know who he is because of his great name. So that's what we're going to try to learn over the next little while. So here's a quote for you today that I found interesting. The name of God is a personal disclosure and reveals his relationship with his people. His name is known only because he chooses to make it known. Think about that. His name is known only because he chooses to make it known. To the Hebrew mind, God was both hidden and revealed, transcendent and imminent. Even though he was mysterious, lofty, and unapproachable, he bridged the gap with mankind by revealing his name. 
Isn't that interesting? Same would be true today. I love it so much. His name is known only because he chooses to make it known. I love that. (laughs) It just gives me such relief that, God, you're known to us because you've chosen to be known to us. Uh, For some, these names will be familiar that I'm going to share. You've heard them for many years. For others, you may be hearing these names for the first time or maybe with a fresh perspective. I'm hoping for a fresh perspective for all of us at the very least. Uh, my challenge to all of us in this series of messages, messages over the next few weeks is to take a look at how we can apply these names of God to every one of the situations we, fa- we face. How can we apply it to every one of the situations that we face? You see, biblical lessons and principles are not given and taught to us for simply good feelings. Let me read that again. Biblical lessons and principles are not given and taught to us for simply good feelings. A lot of us just want an escape uh, way out of the troubled circumstances we find ourselves in. That's not what biblical principles are for. They're not just for escape. Man, my life is crazy. I had way too many kids. What what did I do? You know, (laughs) this is not an escape. You have to deal with the things that you're being faced with in your life. You see, there used to be let me take that back. They are to be used. These words of God are to be used in every day, every area of our life. Okay, here we go. The truth of God's character is focused on his name. So I want you to remember that. The truth of God's character is focused on his name. You see, the, the divine name of God the Father reveals God's power, authority, and holiness. Let me say it again. The, 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 the divine name of God the Father reveals God's power, authority, and holiness. An Old Testament prophet spoke with authority when they uttered God's name. Think about that. An Old Testament prophet would speak with authority when they uttered God's name. In the New Testament, God's name is manifested most clearly in Jesus Christ. We we know that through Scripture. Jesus is called the Word, and Jesus himself makes the claim that he has revealed the name of God. Here's a quote for you. God's name is his promise to dwell with his people. That's what his name is. It's a promise to us. Here's another quote. These reflect the great and varied aspects of God's being and character. They are particularly used by the psalmist to speak of God as a source of strength, security, blessing, and hope. So today we begin our first part, God of the Fathers. You see, the word El, E-L, refers to an awesome power that instills within mankind a mysterious power dread or reverence. That's what the word E-L-L means, all right? You see, before Moses' encounter with God in the Midianite Desert, which we talked about last week, God was known generally as the God of the Fathers. That's how he was known. So the first name that we come across in Scripture, the first one we'll focus on today, is El Shaddai. It simply means these things, God of the mountains or the Almighty God. You've heard that one before. The Almighty God. Exodus chapter 6 verse 3 says this, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Isn't that interesting? He made himself, he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he didn't make himself known to them. Interesting. God used this term to make his covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. It says this, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may, uh, and may multiply you greatly. That's what his plan was. Here's another quote for today. One of the most interesting uses of L is E-L, is its alliance with other terms to reveal the character of God. Isn't that fascinating? When we learn about the names of God, we are opening our minds and spirits to understanding the character of God. We're letting him reveal himself to us. That's what we're doing when, we're, when we learn about the names of God. We're letting him reveal himself to us. So amazing. Here's our second one. So our first one was... El Shaddai, here's our second one. We're going to try five today. Here's our second one, El, Elyon. It means this, the most high God, the exalted one. You see, he is the most high God. He is the one who we exalt. People have asked me about 
other gods. I, get, I used to get asked that all the time. You see, it's irrelevant. It's over when it comes to our God. He is the most high God. That's who he is. You see, kings and kingdoms bow down before him. That's who he is. Think of any royal family. Even in modern times, everyone bows down before our God. He is the most high God. Uh, so many uh, young people that I would minister in Toronto, there's so many religions that uh, it's easy to be spiritual, but it's hard to follow Christ, if you know what I mean. And uh, it's easy to worship a God because there's tons of God in the lives of a young person in the city. But the truth is, is that I would always have uh, d- discussions and get frustrated with young people because I would say, your God is above every other God. And er- all those gods that your friends talk about, they are nothing. They don't even exist. They're nothing uh, uh, against our God. They're nothing. And they would have a hard time with that. Well, who are they, uh, who, they'd say, who are they talking to? I'd say, I don't know. It's just they're talking to air. I have no idea. But our God is the most high God. That's what the scripture tells us. We need to remember it. He is the most high God. He's the king above all kings. Numbers 24 verse 16 says, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the most high who sees the vision of the almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. That's from Numbers chapter 24 verse 16. 2 Samuel 22 verse 14 says this, the Lord thundered from heaven and the most high uttered his voice. Isn't that amazing? You see, our God is not silent. He's not silent. He has a voice, and he will use it. He always does. Melchizedek, the priest, blessed Abraham in the name of El Elyon. Genesis 14, verses 19 to 20 says this, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He is the Most Hi, God. We can always remember that. Now, some of these names I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing, so we're going to start here and see how we do. El Olam. All right? I'm going to say it in an English way and hope for the best. All right. Uh, I should have, I in my Bible software, I have this button I can click, and it speaks it to me in Hebrew. i got to start using it. All right, so I can do, say it better. El Olam. God of eternity. That's what that word means. That's what that name means. Or God, the everlasting one. I love that so much. We're always trying to figure, how old is the earth? How, 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 uh, how old is God? He is the everlasting one. I remember as a child, my mom would say, you can't measure God. He was before time began. He's beyond the time we're living in. That's who he is. You can't measure him. We can't put it into a scientific formula or put it into a sheet with a line on one end and and another on the other. He's the God of eternity or the God, the everlasting one. Genesis 21 verse 33 says this, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. You see, in this passage, we see Abraham, he plants a tree. This tree is symbolic in ancient Near East for fruitfulness of the Lord. That's what that tree is symbolic of. The tree represents Abraham's devotion and recognition of God as the source of prosperity. That's why he planted it. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Even from before, I love that. Take that, scientists. Even from before the earth and the world began, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That was kind of rude. I shouldn't have said that. All right, here's the next one. He is God of eternity. We can't measure the expanse of who he is. Who can compare to his greatness? Nobody can compare to his greatness. He is God of eternity. You see, God's sovereignty extends through the passing of time, beyond our ability to see or understand. Let me read it again. God's sovereignty extends through the passing of time beyond our ability to see or understand. Here's our fourth, fourth one today. El Bereth, God of the covenant. This one's going to be interesting. Judges 9 verse 46 says, says this, when all the leaders of the tower of Shechem heard of it, they entered the stronghold of the house of El Bereth. God alone makes and keeps covenant. You see, this passage in Judges is written to remind us that God keeps covenant, even if we don't. You see, these people uh, that we just read about in Scripture, they had turned against the Lord to worship another God. You see, even against the stronghold of evil, God 
will keep his covenant. Even though you and I may turn to our wicked ways, he will keep his covenant with us. He will fight against the evil that is within us. He will fight our battles. Exodus 14, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 14 says, The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. We live in a world where most likely every one of us in this room have either been a part of or have witnessed covenant breaking. That's the honest to goodness truth. You see, I wonder what a church would look like that is full of believers who hold fast to their covenants. Covenants with one another, covenant, covenants with their friends, covenants with, the, with their family, covenants with their children, covenants with their spouses, and covenants with God. You see, God never breaks covenant. He never does. What he says, he will do. Here's, uh, I looked up the word covenant in my uh, Bible dictionary. It says this, God's covenant can be trusted. Truthfully, he's probably the only one, right? C.S. Lewis wrote this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speak to us in our consciousness, and shouts to us in our pain. Let me read it again. I love C.S. Lewis. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciousness, and shouts to us in our pain. Here's our fifth one today. L. Roy, E-L-R-O-I. <laughs> He's the God who sees, or the God of vision. God sees the needs of his people and responds. That's who he is. Genesis 16, verse 13 says this. So she, the she is Hagar, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly I have seen him who looks after me. You see, God sees and hears our sorrow. He does. He's the God who sees. He's the God who sees right where you are. That's who he is. Today I'm, I'm reflecting on all those that we may consider lost today. People in our life that seem far from God. Interestingly, interestingly, in this passage, Hagar is fleeing for her safety in the midst of turmoil and fear. The message that the Lord sends to Hagar is, I see you. That's what he sent. How many people here today needed to remember and know that God sees you? How many, how many of us need to hear that message today? God sees us. You know, I think of the weather that's happening in the Carolinas the last few days, even at this moment. Many thousands of people, even millions maybe, are asking God, why? Why, God? You see, today our encouragement is that God sees us. That's what he does. He sees us. God sees us in our circumstance and situation. That's who he is. He sees us. Here's a quote that I thought was fitting uh, to close with today. Listen to this. When everything else is over and said and done, only one thing ultimately matters. Do you know God, and can you face eternity with him? You see, for me, part of knowing God is knowing uh, these names that I've talked about today. I have a list of these names that we're going to be working through in the coming weeks. But today I wanted to start with these names because they are classified as, as I mentioned earlier, God of the Fathers. These are the first names that God revealed. What this tells us is that these names were chosen by God to be used by his people. He wants us to use them. They help describe to us who God is. They help us identify with God. I read this at the beginning and want to share it as we uh, conclude this morning. The name of God is a personal disclosure and reveals his relationship with his people. His name is known only because he chooses to make it known. To the Hebrew mind, God was both hidden and revealed, transcendent and imminent. Even though he was mysterious, lofty, and unapproachable, he bridged the gap with mankind by revealing his name.